What's going on, Blitz team? So we continue on with our series of top 10 videos. And this time, we're going to get into the greatest NBA players of all time. You guys got to hear me out to the end of the video, and you'll understand where I'm coming from as to why I have each of these individuals ranked where I do. Now, of course, I'm sure you guys have your own lists. Make sure to leave those lists in the comments section and explain to people why you have your list ranked the way that you do. Now, usually I jump right into number 10, but this time we're going to do it a little different. Uh, there's a guy that I've got at number 11 that I've got so much respect and admiration for. And I've got to explain why I've got him on the outside looking in when it comes to my top 10 greatest players of all time. And that's number 11, Bill Russell. So here we go. Why do I have an 11 time champion at number 11, just outside of the top 10 greatest players of all time list? Well, it's pretty simple. He played, he played a great role in his team's success, but his limitations as a scorer put him just outside of the top 10 for me. You couldn't feed Bill Russell the basketball and expect him to just take over a game with the scoring, stand back, let him go to work. You know, that was not his game. And there's another caveat to that. But yes, he controlled, dominated, and had a large impact on the game on the defensive end. Yes, he was an amazing outlet passer. Those are two of the reasons why I have him at number 11. But he was obviously surrounded by a, you know, a lot of great talent on the Celtics. Playmakers, you know, a playmaker like Bob Cousy. But more importantly, good scorers. You had John Havlicek, who was one of the best scorers in that era. And again, people would go back and look at his field goal percentage and say, oh, come on, the guy was a volume shooter. Compare his field goal percentage to the league average that year. And I think that's the better way to do it. These guys didn't have YouTube to study the videos and steal moves and all this, that, and the other. They were the foundation. They were the building blocks. So I think it's only fair to compare them to their contemporaries, all right? You know, like I said, Bob Cousy, amazing ball handler, playmaker. Sam Jones, he was clutch. Bill Sharman, another good scorer. Tommy Heinsohn, he was a good scorer. So Bill Russell was surrounded by these great scorers throughout his career. And he was afforded the luxury of having his deficiencies as a scorer, scoring the basketball, hidden by his teammates, by the talent around him. It goes hand in hand. It's not just, well, he had Hall of Famers, you know, no, no, no. He was not a great scorer. But there's no doubt when you talk about his defense, he did have a capable offensive game. He could score. You know, his passing was pretty good. Definitely played a role in those championships, a, a big role. But I can't look into this camera with a straight face and try to tell you that a player who had the limitations that he did offensively and had so many teammates pick up the slack for his scoring, is higher than number 11 all time. Now, in his career, he averaged 15.1 points, 22.5 rebounds, 4.3 assists on 44% shooting. Again, compare it to the other players in the era. He averaged 16.2 points, 24.9 rebounds, 4.7 assists, 43% shooting in the playoffs for his career. And amazingly enough, he only averaged over 20 points per game twice in the playoffs and never even had a season averaging over 19 points per game in the regular season in his entire career. With that being said, he could score. Great outlet passer. You know, the impact he had on the game defensively cannot go understated. But that's why I have him at number 11 all time. He won the MVP award five times, all-star. Um, he was an NBA all-star 12 times, all-NBA first team three times. Now, well, there was this guy, Will Chamberlain, right? All-NBA second team eight times, all-defensive first team one time, but that award didn't exist until 1969. Uh, he would have been on it every year. NBA rebounding champion five times, all-star MVP one time. He would have had a number of NBA Finals MVPs. The number is debatable, all right? But that award did not exist while he was playing, and they named the award after him. 
appropriately so. He had an 11-1 record in the NBA Finals, despite his offensive limitations. And his impact on the court was amazing. I mean, the way he controlled the game or impacted the game defensively, you know, good rebounder, great rebounder. Um, And then, of course, um, you know, with some passing. But his impact off the court far outweighs his impact on the court. I've got so much respect for him. Don't view this ranking as disrespect. But again, to me, it's just not intellectually honest to put a guy with those type of limitations offensively in my top 10. All right, number 10, Magic Johnson. Some of you are looking at your screen right now like, what the heck? He's got Bill Russell at 11, Magic at 10. And you're saying, whoa, what's going on here? So before I go into the positives with Magic Johnson, why I do have him in the top 10, let me explain why he's at the bottom of my top 10. Similar criticism. We're talking about individual greatest players of all time. His game was too reliant on teammates around him for me to rank him any higher. On the defensive end, he was not a great one-on-one defender. He put in effort. He wasn't bad. But he wasn't great. You know, he was good at getting in pass lanes and things of that nature. But one-on-one, he wasn't going to really take over a game with his defense. And on the offensive end, his ball-in-hand game, when you're talking about his scoring, it was limited. Yes, he could score out of the post. Yes, he could drive to the basket. Yes, he did take over game six of the 1980 NBA Finals. But by and large, his game, by its own nature, was reliant on players around him. And his ability, if all else was failing, to take that basketball and take a game over with his offense, with his scoring, more specifically, just was not there. You know, was he the best passing point guard of all time? I would say yes. Most dynamic, for sure. I don't see anyone throwing John Stockton on their list for those exact reasons. No world championships, yeah, but nobody even brings him up. Load up on Magic's drive. Double team him in the post. Of course, he's going to pass, but he's not going to score. Right? And you ask him to beat you, taking the basketball at the top of the key, making a quick move and hitting a pull-up jumper. Couldn't do it. I can't rationalize putting him any higher than 10. And yes, he was able to elevate his teammates with the score or with, excuse me, with his passing. But that's not as lethal as someone who can consistently take over games with their scoring. Again, greatest individual players of all time, not the greatest players who had the best teammates and right. No, these are the greatest individual players of all time. A guy who can take over a game with his scoring, it's more, eh, he's not as reliant on the players around him. And a lot of those guys could also pass. There's two sides to the coin. So, yes, he got a lot out of role players. Things in you know, scoring performances that they wouldn't have done on their own. But there were also a ton of passes to guys like James Worthy and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar who just needed a simple feed, and they do the rest. So now that I've explained that, let's get to the positives. Magic averaged 19.5 points, 11.2 assists, and 7.2 rebounders per game in his career. He was a good rebounder. He averaged 19.5 points, 7.7 rebounds, 12.3 assists on 50.6% shooting in the playoffs for his career. He was the initiator of the Showtime Lakers, and his passing ability in the half-court set was good, but his passing ability in the break was spectacular, the best the game's ever seen. He led the NBA in assists four times. He led the NBA in playoff assists five times, led the NBA in steals twice, getting into those pass lanes. He's number one all-time in assists per game for his career. Holds the all-time record for average assists per game in the playoffs, 12.3. Holds the record for highest assists per game in a series, 15.2. The most assists in a playoff game, 24. 
Highest assist per game in an NBA Finals series, 14.0 per game. Most assist in a singular NBA Finals game, 21. He also hit 11 game winners and had 10 games of 40 points or more in his career. He could score. It's just not something he could go to and consistently take over a game with that. Again, reliant on others. Magic's career was, man, I'll never forget when he made that announcement. I remember watching SportsCenter that night and when he when he contracted HIV and it was it was shocking. But despite his early retirement, he still finished top five in MVP voting nine times. He's a great team player, of course. He won the NBA Finals MVP award three times, the NBA MVP award three times, NBA All-Star. He was an NBA All-Star 12 times, All-NBA First Team nine times, All-NBA Second Team one time, and All-Star MVP two times. I was a Magic Johnson fan. I hated Larry Bird. You know, before the Bulls drafted Michael Jordan, I was a shorty, and I heard that this guy's name was Magic, and wow, you know. But being intellectually honest with myself, the limitations as a defender and the limitations when it comes to having the ability to take over a game with your scoring, that lethal skill set. I can't put them higher than 10, guys. And Magic was 5-4 and four in the NBA Finals. He played on some amazing teams. I respect Magic so much. This was really hard for me to do. But again, I've got to be intellectually honest with myself. I've got him at number 10. Number nine, LeBron James. So I'm probably going to have to go into a long explanation with this one, considering, you know, the hype and the hysteria that surrounds LeBron today. So let me begin explaining why I have LeBron at number nine. It's kind of similar to Bill Russell and Magic with a game that's reliant on others around him, but it's a little more nuanced than that. Now, obviously, LeBron's accolades speak for themselves. His stats are awe-inspiring to many, but that comes without context, right? So let me provide you with some context and explain to you how I went from being a LeBron defender, a witness, to a guy who doesn't hold his legacy in the same high regard that many others do. So when you talk about LeBron's brand, and this has nothing to do with him personally, well, a little bit, but when you talk about his brand, what's his brand? What do people know him for? LeBron's brand has been built on two things, his athleticism and his stats, right? Now, athletically, when you're talking about straight line speed, hops, and size, I definitely agree with the narrative, right? From a lateral movement perspective and body control perspective, I don't agree with the narrative that he's head and shoulders above everyone else in history. Now, the more important part of his brand, the thing every sports show and every sports guy and every commentator, right? The thing that they used to kind of, I guess, everything on the planet uses to market him are his stats. I mean, those stats have become so highly regarded that I saw a report that came out, uh, or I think it was Bleacher Report, before the uh, season started this year, 2018-19, that said LeBron has risen above winning. Wow. Okay. So you've got the XXYYZZ, I like to call it. The points, rebounds, and assists, right? And he actually does feed into that narrative himself quite often. He'll say he's not a scorer, despite the fact he's in the top 10 and climbing that top 10 rapidly when it comes to shot attempts in his career. How can you be in the top 10 in shot attempts in your career, but you're not a scorer? When someone tells me, Okay, name a basketball player who was not a scorer. They were a pass-first player. I would say Jason Kitt. That's not a scorer. That's a pass-first player, right? 
And what was I talking about when he feeds into the narrative? Well, you'll hear him talk about his stats. He had the famous check my stats t-shirt. Or he'll say things like he, he talks about assisting. Not passing. Assisting. It's his word, not mine. First time I heard him say that, I was like, what? Assisting, I was assisting my teammates. He feeds into that marketing as well, right? Russell Westbrook is a stats guy. His numbers are ridiculous. Doesn't play much defense, but he's a stats guy. But Russell Westbrook and LeBron James opened my eyes to something and made me personally completely change the way I look at the game of basketball when you're talking about the greatest players. Follow me here. You'll see where I'm coming from. Just how valuable are those rebounds and assists? Did you hear me? Not all rebounds and assists are created equal. So just how valuable are those rebounds and assists? When you look at any year of LeBron's career, he racks up rebounds. Uncontested, I might add. And again, any year, going back to the beginning of his career, And how does he do it when you look at those on film? Because we got to weigh the value of these sort of things. Well, by sagging off on defense, neglecting defense, and cherry-picking rebound after rebound, just pick a game. Go look at it. It's on film. Offensive rebounds are the most challenging rebounds in the game of basketball. Why? Because by nature, you're out of position. The defender's going to have inside leverage on you. Guess what? LeBron's not a great offensive rebounder, so maybe people need to rethink this notion that he's some great rebounder. Even Michael Jordan, a guard, had a higher offensive rebound rate than LeBron. Really? Think about that. I hope you guys are really thinking about this. Those of you who haven't heard this before. And offensively, he's always got the ball in his hands. You know, he sure did accumulate. Again, we're trying to weigh the value of these passes. He accumulated a ton of assists on pick and pops. Going way back to Zadrunas Ogaskis, Chris Bosch. Look at all the assists to those guys running simple pick and pops. He's literally doing nothing. It's a simple pick and pop. A ton of his assists are simple feeds during set plays. Or he's just waiting for the action off the ball. And he's passing the ball to guys, simple passes you and I could make. And he's passing the ball to the guy coming off screens for catch and shoot jumpers or cuts to the basket. It's an action. It's a simple feed. He also has a ton of assists to guys where he did nothing to open up a shot. But they just made a contested jumper. Just a simple pass. Shoot. From the top of the key. And with the way they score assists today, it's very relaxed. It's mind-boggling some of these passes that get counted as assists in the break. Or passes to a guy who puts the ball on the floor from outside of the three-point line. It... Beats his defender, takes it to the basket, and it's like, whoa, they gave LeBron that assist. Or a guy who makes one to two moves, and he gets the assist. That's actually the lesser end of of all of this. So as a former witness, I had to ask myself, is it intellectually honest to continue to rank LeBron high because of low-value rebounds? Low-value assists, simple assists, just because they show up in a box score. You know, I think about some of those passes to Kyle Korver where he was coming off pin down, stagger sets, whatever have you. And LeBron's just standing there holding the ball or dribbling. And he waits, and then it's just a simple feed. And sometimes he would like, ooh, I'm going to do this one behind the back. You know, unnecessary. Didn't even have to. And I'm like, geez, man, these do not bring any value to winning a basketball game. They just don't. 
Now, don't get me wrong. He's had some high-value assists. Some of those cross-court passes, which, again, they usually end up with a guy It's not really freeing him up. The defense rotates back over. He's got to hit a contested jumper. It's not super high value to me. The drive and kick assist is uh, his most valuable assist. You know, oh, you got the pick and rolls too, which any point guard in the, in the NBA can run that. Um, so it's it, the value of these passes, or as he would call it, him assisting his teammates, isn't as much as a box score would tell you. And then you also add in the fact that he's never sacrificed his stats to play in a system, including running coaches off or trying to in Miami. Even when he went to Miami, Chris Bosh completely scrapped his game, became a pick-and-pop player. After their first year and his colossal failure in the 2011 finals, by the way, Dwayne Wade would have probably been the MVP. But during the 2012 offseason, Dwayne Wade talked about how he was studying Michael Jordan footage of Jordan working off the ball because he wanted to change his game going into the next season to fit LeBron's more. So Dwayne Wade, who was a great ball handler, lethal scorer, sacrificed his ball in hand game to play off the ball more with with drives to the basket, mid-range catch and shoot jumpers. So LeBron could continue to ball dominate. And every team LeBron's been on, he's had the green light and been allowed to ball dominate and never sacrifice those stats to be part of a system. When you're talking about the greatest players of all time, almost every single one of them had to. So this is like green light, say ball hogging because of how much he has it in his hands. Stat stuffing. And folks, again, a lot of these passes are just simple feeds where he's waiting for an action at the top of the key in the pinch post, maybe the post, maybe working off the pick and roll for the teammate to free themselves up just to make a simple feed. How is that high value? How am I supposed to go X, X, Y, Y, Z, Z and say that that makes him greater than someone who could shut someone down on defense and take over a game with their scoring at will, right? It just doesn't work that way. The two most valuable elements an individual player can bring to a basketball team is defense and scoring when you really think about it. You could completely change the dynamic of the game and take over a basketball game by shutting down the other team's best player or taking the basketball and going, that's it, they're going on a run, I'm going to counterbalance this, and in crunch time, give me that. I'm taking this game over with my jumper or whatever. Neither are his strength. So with scoring, there have been games in LeBron's career where he took over the game with his scoring, no doubt. But we're talking about the greatest players of all time. Is LeBron really a guy who does consistently take over a game with his scoring? No. Or has his limitations as a scorer hindered him in big games where he could have changed the outcome of the game by taking over the game during an opposing team's run? Not pass the ball to a lesser talented teammate over and over again during key situations? When you look at LeBron's stats, they don't tell the whole story there either. There's two key points to that. Only 33% of his points in his career have come on makes outside of 10 feet. The rest of his points have come inside of 10 feet and from free throws. That's important. This is not level of difficulty. I'll explain why that's important. Folks, the free throw line is 15 feet away from the backboard. So we're talking about five feet inside of the free throw line, right? To the backboard. So why is that important? It's because LeBron's scoring comes within the flow of a game. Not the flow of an offense, but the flow of a game. And with the defensive three-second rule and no hand checking, there are points in time during the game, and you'll actually see him face up and wait for the bigs to clear out of the paint. You see this a lot. And he can easily get that first step on a handcuffed defender 
Usually it involves driving a shoulder into them and whatever, which I wouldn't have a problem with if they weren't handcuffed. And he scores at the rim against late help defense. And there are so many games where his outside jumper or just even his mid-range jumper outside of 10 feet is extremely bad. It's extremely shaky. You can go through and look at a bunch of shot charts and just look at his shots outside the paint. More often than not, not very good. And this means that LeBron does not have the consistent ability to take over a game with his scoring. He does sometimes, but not often enough. His footwork is not elite. His lateral movement is limited. He doesn't really shake defenders with the ball in hand, right? That's what I mean by lateral movements, not elite. He's relegated to bullying his way to the basket like he's Jerome Bettis. Or he'll take a clunky step back jumper. And you've seen in big series, you've seen defenses sagging off him five feet and daring him to shoot the jumper. The Mavs, the Spurs come to mind. And he just wouldn't shoot it. He gave up the basketball. I'm like, what are you doing? And even on post-ups, he's got a signature move where he'll do a turnaround fadeaway. But he doesn't really use shoulder fakes, good footwork. He doesn't have counter moves or counters to the counter. He's limited in those situations too. Very limited one-on-one score. Like even on those jumpers out of the post, he's kind of muscling through those situations. And I could give you so many specific examples of him giving up the basketball in big game situations with midgets on him by his size, including Steph Curry, who's a terrible defender. And I, I'm not talking about at the top of the key. I'm talking about many different situations. But we'll just leave it at that. Very limited as a score. So defensively, he's got five all defensive first team selections. And the truth of the matter is, we've seen the likes of Shane Battier. Oh gosh, one of the most embarrassing ones was Richard Jefferson being forced to check Kevin Durant so LeBron could hang out by the low block and collect rebounds. In the NBA Finals, he was like, what, 36, 38 at the time, something like that. And in LeBron sagging off less threatening players and just collecting those uncontested boards because I guess those look better in a box score. Now, he's shown the ability to be a good defender at times. Those were small stretches in a game. His chase down blocks were great. But by and large, throughout the entirety of his career, he's done a ton of standing around on defense. And if you pay close attention, he looks much more interested in those rebounds than he does playing defense. And we're talking about the vast majority of his career. In fact, if you guys really think about it, just think about it. Parameter players with a high rebound total, unless there are a bunch of long rebounds that night, it's usually an indication that perimeter player was not playing much defense on the perimeter in the basketball game. Otherwise, they'd be out of position for those boards. By nature. So in summary, LeBron is a guy who has taken over some games with his scoring, but he can't consistently do it because I honestly think he's too concerned about his shooting percentage. I remember a story where Dwayne Wade said him and LeBron, we're going to focus on trying to have a high field goal percentage this year. This is a number of years back in Miami, and they were going to stop shooting threes. And I'm like, he pays attention to his field goal percentage. That's weird. And I mean, yeah, you want to kind of be cognizant of it, but you're really thinking about that on the court? His jumper is streaky. And on many nights, the jumper's not there. So he just completely abandons his J. And that's when you get those late game situations where instead of taking a jump shot, He's given the basketball up. I don't know if it's because he's too cognizant of his field goal percentage. But when you're talking about a lot of the greatest players of all time, they weren't thinking about that. They were just like, you know what? I'm the best option. I'm going to win. He doesn't have that. 
You know, and then sometimes I question his competitive drive or things that he said after games where I'm not going to lose any sleep over this or they got to go back to their regular jobs talking about the fans. You know, my career is not defined by winning, basically, as he said in a roundabout way. Where's his competitive drive at? He's competitive, but maybe not as much as some of these other greats. And again, he's a guy who's had memorable moments on defense, and that built up a reputation. But by and large, he's been a lazy defender throughout his career, more concerned with being in a position for an uncontested rebound than playing defense. And his assists are a product of ball dominating, while people ignore the work that his teammates did to free themselves up for that shot. Off the ball. And you could point to the likes of Giannis Antetokounmpo and Ben Simmons, embarrassingly flawed skill sets when you ta- you're talking about the dynamics of their game and their moves and their repertoire and their jump shots. My gosh. But look at their numbers. They look great. But those guys are extreme examples of what LeBron does. LeBron's never been the best in the NBA at anything. He's just really good at a number of things. Yes, he's a good passer. Yes. Yes, he collects a number of rebounds. Yes. And yes, he's mastered his way of scoring the basketball, which looks great in a box score. You know, and the way he plays has you know enabled him to statistically dominate his era. You can't ignore that. Sometimes I wonder if he plays for his stats because in fact, I think he does. This is a guy who the media was just so blown away with his memory of specific plays after a game. A guy with that type of memory isn't keeping track of his numbers. He probably is. And there have been a lot of NBA players throughout history who have done that. The difference is he's never sacrificed that. One might say that the limitations to his game hidden by statistics is why he needed lethal scores next to him, right? For example, Scottie Pippen is number 42 all-time in NBA Finals points per game. Whereas you've got Kyrie Irving, who's number eight, and Dwayne Wade is number 19. These guys in the NBA Finals, their career averages are 27.69 points per game for Kyrie Irving, 23.90 23.90 for Dwayne Wade, and those came down in the last run, right? So those limitations to his game with his scoring were covered up by teammates who were more lethal scorers than him. Without those guys, he doesn't win championships. And you could say that about anyone. It's a team game. But what I'm saying is, similar to Bill Russell, having great scorers around him to hide his limitations. When you look at the fine details of LeBron James and his limitations as a scorer, Wade and Irving covered that. That's why he went running Dwayne Wade's team. So maybe LeBron James is actually more like Scottie Pippen than he is Michael Jordan. You can draw your own conclusions with that statement. He's better than Scottie, but not defensively he's not, but. The best thing LeBron James has going for his legacy is clearly longevity. His sustained level of statistical production continues to grow his career numbers. And that's going to be used to brand his all-time ranking. Until you put all of his game under a microscope and get past the XXYYZZ, it's a very convincing argument for a lot of people. And... Again, being intellectually honest with myself, I think there may come a day where we need to have a conversation about the two super team chasers, LeBron James and Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant's the more lethal of the two. He's got less holes in his game as a scorer. He shut it down in the finals and LeBron ran away from guarding him. And KD's defense is underrated. I've seen a lot of games where You wouldn't see LeBron do this, but you see KD do it where there's someone else on the other team going off and he's like, you know what? 
I got him. So I think that's a conversation for maybe the next time I do one of these type of videos. Or maybe just a separate video. Here on the site. So LeBron has four league MVPs and three finals MVPs. And we'll see where his accolades end up when he retires. Still got him in my top 10. Great player. But looking at the fine details of his game, I had to explain why he's only at number 10. Or excuse me, at number 9. And maybe, just maybe, LeBron always needing more help, according to his fans, is because his game is so reliant on everyone else to win. And people just don't see those fine details because they're mesmerized by the box score. LeBron James' record in the NBA Finals, he's 3-6. and six. And I think a lot of the reasons I stated is why. Because maybe these elements to his game aren't as valuable as people make them out to be. He's won 18 games in the NBA Finals and he's lost 31. My number nine. LeBron James. All right, my number eight, Shaquille O'Neal, Shaq. Shaq in his career, and of course these numbers came down a little bit, but uh, with the seasons he had towards the end of his career, but he averaged 23.7 points, 10.9 rebounds, 2.5 assists, 2.3 blocks, and an amazing 58.2% shooting. He averaged over 15 rebounds twice in the playoffs, over 30 points per game three times in the playoffs, and his playoff numbers ended up uh, settling at 24.3 points, 11.6 rebounds, 2.7 assists, on 50.4% shooting in the playoffs for his career. Shaq averaged 27.2 points, 12.5 rebounds, 2.8 blocks on 58.1% shooting with the Magic. And he averaged 27 points, 11.8 rebounds, 2.5 blocks on 57.5% shooting with the Lakers. From the 99-2000 season to 2001-2002, he averaged 28.5 points, 12.3 rebounds per game. During the playoffs during that stretch, 29.9 points, 14.5 rebounds. And in the finals during that stretch, 35.9 points and 15.2 rebounds. And let's break those up individually. Against the Pacers, 38.16 rebounds, two assists on 61% shooting. 38-16! Against the 76ers, 33 points, 15 rebounds, four assists on 57% shooting. Against the Nets, 36 points, 12 rebounds on 59% shooting. And then, of course, the final run against Detroit. 20, with, with the Lakers, 26 points, 10 rebounds, but um, wasn't, get, wasn't getting the ball as much in that series. So I wanted to run through those ridiculous numbers because Shaq was the most dominant physical force in NBA history. And that's no disrespect to Wilt because Wilt was an unstoppable monster, but he was more finesse than Shaq. And Shaq had more of a power game than Wilt. Now, I think Shaq's footwork in the post gets underrated by a lot of people. Whether he was hitting you with that drop step or he was spinning to the paint for his baby hook, he had counter moves. He had go-to moves and counter moves, and he was literally unstoppable. He made over 70% of his shots at the rim, and he was so unstoppable that teams would literally follow him to stop him. Because let's face it, Shaq's free throw shooting was his kryptonite. In the playoffs, though, I remember a ton of games during the hack of Shaq where he made a number of big free throws, and that strategy backfired. He was a willing passer out of the post, whether it was passes to cutting teammates, kickouts or reposts or kickouts for threes. He had that tool in his toolbox, too. Defensively, he could be an imposing rim protector if he wasn't too far out of position. And he did impact games defensively at times, altering shots or blocking shots at the rim. But his defense wasn't the greatest, right? His one-on-one defense in the post was stout, and that defense held up as long as he wasn't playing against someone like Hakeem. 
That being said, it's simple, man. Shaq's ability to take a game over with his scoring. And he did that by imposing his will on these defenders. He was getting hacked and held and grabbed and double teamed and whatever had you. He was, he was just dominating with his scoring. And they had to commit multiple defenders to try to stop him. And if he gave the ball up to a teammate, you know, teams were often late rotating to the weak side of the play. So if he gave the ball up and you got a swing pass, he opened up a lot of shots for his teammates in that way, not necessarily directly off an assist. I guess you'd call it hockey assist, right? But when push came to shove and Shaq needed to take a game over, you were absolutely at his mercy. You couldn't stop him. The big Aristotle was unstoppable. He was the dominant force. Kobe was great on those championships. But he was the dominant force. There was nothing you could do to match up with him. Nothing. And someone who dominated the way that he did to three NBA championships. I got to have him at number eight. He won the NBA Finals MVP award three times. NBA MVP award one time. NBA All-Star 15 times. NBA scoring champion twice. All NBA first team eight times, all NBA second team two times, all NBA third team four times. He was on the all defensive second team three times in the all-star MVP three times. His record in the finals was four and two. Why? Because he was the mismatch. He was the unstoppable force. I remember when the Lakers were on their uh, three-peat run. And I said to myself, man, this may be the guy. I was thinking at the time that Shaq may be the one to pass Mike. Because when you think about the way he dominated in the finals and in big games and was able to just, Im- just impose his will on the game and demoralize and dominate the defender, that reminded me of Jordan in that sense. So... I've got Shaq at number eight, the most physically imposing and dominant force from a physical standpoint in NBA history. All right, number seven, Kobe Bryant. Kobe Bryant's skill set, it's the closest skill set we've seen when you're talking about comparing players to Michael Jordan. Now... There were fine detailed differences between the two, but I'll save that for another time. Um, You know, Kobe, of course, had the ability to take over a basketball game outside of the team offense, and he did that an awful lot throughout his career. It was a double-edged sword at times, but his ability to do that made him the most lethal scorer since Michael Jordan. Maybe Kevin Durant's got an argument, maybe Steph Curry at times, but I think Kobe... uh, You know, when you're talking about that mid-range game, and of course he hit a number of threes as well. And Kobe was also a tenacious defender through the prime of his career who would harass his assignment and completely disrupt their rhythm and affect the game on the defensive end. Now, I was guilty of this in the past, and there's a lot of people who still do it, but some people highlight The selfishness of a player who puts up a bunch of shots. But those same people ignore the players in NBA history who refuse to sacrifice their statistics and aren't happy unless they're allowed to run an offense where they can ball dominate and get their stats. Kobe did sacrifice his stats. Yes, you heard that right. Kobe sacrificed his stats when he was playing next to Shaq. He bought into the triangle offense. Yes, there were times where Kobe went outside of that offense, but for years he conformed to it. It was happy winning championships. Even though he could have demanded the basketball more, ball dominated, chased triple doubles, chased box scores, supremacy, right? 
I mean, you're talking about a guy with nine, I believe it's 95 games in the regular season and playoffs with 10 assists or more, 127 games in the regular season and playoffs with 10 rebounds or more. Kobe could have sagged off on defense, cherry-picked rebounds, ball dominated, and fished for assists, put up whatever numbers he wanted. But Kobe Bryant was an aggressive killer. On both ends of the court, he looked to attack you on, on the defensive end, right? By getting all up in your grill if you were the other team's best player on the offensive end. He was looking to take over the game with his lethal scoring. And that's just what the doctor ordered for the five-time champion. You know, Kobe Bryant, who scored 30 points in a quarter twice, had a game with 12 three-pointers, scored 60-plus points in games six times, had a stretch of four 50-plus point games in a row, had a stretch with 40-point games, nine games in a row, once scored 55 points and a half in the 81-point game. He even had a stretch during his career where he made 62 consecutive free throws. Similar to Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant saw a bunch of double teams and was still able to control the game with his scoring. His game was not reliant on teammates hitting shots, not bulldozing to the rim, but by scoring from all areas of the court. And it gave the Los Angeles Lakers that constant matchup advantage led to a ton of wins, caused defenses to scheme for him, and his scoring opened up the floor for his teammates. And like I said, Kobe Bryant sacrificed his stats playing next to Shaq, which was the right thing to do. Shaq was the most unstoppable force in the NBA at the time. With that being said, Kobe Bryant had made up his mind that he wanted to prove that he could win championships without Shaq. They didn't fail, and Kobe went running to super teams. That's the type of competitor he was. He wanted to prove he wanted to prove that he could be the unquestionable number one on a championship team. So when Shaq left, Kobe Bryant had the ultimate green light. And he went on a scoring assault that the league hadn't seen since Michael Jordan. And the league hasn't seen since. And then Kobe Bryant again went back to sacrificing his statistics to buy back into the system. And led the Lakers to two more championships with Pau Gasol as his sidekick. We're talking about a Pau Gasol that averaged only 17 points per game in his career in the NBA Finals. Kobe led the Lakers to a slaughter over the Orlando Magic, the same Orlando Magic team who ran LeBron James out of the gym. And Kobe Bryant led the Lakers to a championship, beating the Boston Celtics, who had at least three Hall of Famers on the team. Again, with Pau Gasol as his sidekick. Come on, man. It's time to stop looking beyond statistics in this mythical X, X, Y, Y, Z, Z, who's leading in more categories that makes them the better player. It's not true. Kobe Bryant won two finals MVPs, an NBA MVP award. He was an NBA All-Star 18 times, All-NBA first team 11 times, All-NBA second team two times, All-NBA third team two times, All-NBA defensive first team nine times, All-NBA defensive second team three times. And he has four All-Star MVPs. A dude was a killer. A killer. And I've got to wait. Guys who weren't so reliant on their teammates and could take over a game on their own. To me, that's greater. Kobe Bryant's career NBA Finals record, games-wise, was 25-11. and 11, And his overall NBA Finals Series record was 5-2. and two. My number seven greatest player of all time, the Black Mamba, Kobe Bryant. Six. 
My number six greatest player of all time, Hakeem the Dream Olajuwon. Hakeem is another one of the, another member of the long list of NBA greats during that era who were overshadowed by the great Michael Jordan. Hakeem was the only player in NBA history, did you hear me, the only player in NBA history to win an NBA League MVP, Defensive Player of the Year, and NBA Finals MVP in the same year. You hear a lot today about players, well, they're resting on defense. Hakeem holds an NBA record for leading a team in four out of the five major categories, which he did nine times. In Hakeem's 1994 championship run, he led the Rockets in points, rebounds, assists, steals, and blocks. During that run, he led the Rockets to wins over Clyde Drexler and the Blazers, stifled Charles Barkley and Carl Malone, and completely shut down Patrick Ewing to the tune of 36% shooting. 36% shooting. Here's the thing about that run for Hakeem Olajuwon. He was dominating on both ends of the court, which he did throughout his career. He didn't have a single all-star for a teammate, similar to Jordan in 91 or 98. Hakeem didn't have a single Hall of Famer for a teammate, but he beat Hall of Famers in every single round of the playoffs. It was one of the greatest. I mean, you could make an argument the greatest individual playoff run in NBA history. You could make that argument on both sides of the court. You could make that argument. His 1995 championship run, the Rockets were a sixth seed. That's right, a sixth seed. He led a sixth seed to wins over Stockton and Malone's Jazz, Barkley and KJ's Suns, Rodman and Robinson Spurs, Shaq and Penny's Magic. And he absolutely locked down MVP David Robinson in the Western Conference Finals. In the NBA Finals, he had his hands full with Shaq, but he outscored Shaq in every game, put up 32.8 points, 11.5 rebounds, 5.5 assists, 2.0 steals, 2.0 2.0 blocks. And remember, during that 1995 Houston Rockets championship run that Hakeem was just ridiculous, they didn't have home court advantage in any series. So the 1994 and 1995 championship run cemented Hakeem's legacy. Everyone knew how great of a player he was. But if you're just talking about Hakeem as a peer player, Hakeem didn't just have go-to moves. He had counter moves, and he had counters to the counters. Without a shadow of a doubt, Hakeem Olajuwon was the most versatile and skilled big man to ever play the game of basketball. He could run the floor in his prime. He could move off the ball. But Hakeem was a player who was not reliant on teammates around him to take over a basketball game. You could just feed Hakeem, let him go to work. Didn't matter if it was against good one-on-one defenders, double teams, didn't matter. And I feel as though that quality in basketball players has become vastly underrated and it's been replaced with XXYYZZ, which I was guilty of that myself. I feel like the media has conditioned fans to believe that box scores are all that matters rather than the old-fashioned eye test and a little bit of logic. I mean, we're talking about a two-time defensive player of the year who would give you buckets. That speaks for itself. Hakeem won the NBA Finals MVP two times, the NBA MVP one time. Jordan kind of had a lock on that. NBA All-Star. 12 times, NBA Defensive Player of the Year twice, all NBA first team six times in a stacked era for big men, all NBA second team three times, all NBA third team three times. He was all, in, he was all defensive first team five times and all defensive second team four times. 
And Hakeem was 2-1 and one in the NBA Finals. Beast. You know, you always hear two-way player. Why do we have to separate it? Like, well, these guys that don't play defense will give them a pass. And we'll call them the best players in the league. But the guys who actually play defense, we'll give them in their own category that we don't revere as much and call them two-way players. No, he's the number six greatest player of all time. Hakeem Olajuwon. All right, my number five, Tim Duncan. Not enough people have him in their top five. And I'll explain why. Tim Duncan averaged 19 points, uh, 10.8 rebounds, three assists, 2.2 blocks, and 50.9% shooting in the regular season. Raised his level of play in the playoffs. Had some amazing playoff performances. He averaged 20.6 points, 10, or excuse me, 11.4 rebounds, three assists, 2.3 blocks on 50.1% shooting in the playoffs for his career. He had 15 all defensive team selections. Did you hear that? 15! An NBA record. Eight on the first team, seven on the second team. And he anchored some of the best defenses in NBA history. Great defender. And on the offensive end, Tim Duncan, well, it wasn't the most exciting skill set for some people, but that's why it was fundamental. Fundamentals by nature aren't exciting, and that's why he was the big fundamental. And he was consistent. And when Tim Duncan needed to in a number of big games, he put his foot on the gas pedal and would take over those games with his scoring. It was that rare, consistent presence he brought to the table on the defensive end of the court, combined with his fundamental ability to score the basketball, that has him so high on my list. Tim Duncan, one of the great enigmas, I guess you could say, in NBA history. He didn't dream of being like Mike, like Kobe or LeBron. This guy was a champion swimmer in the Virgin Islands when in 1989, Hurricane Hugo destroyed the island's only Olympic-sized swimming pool. So Duncan started training in the ocean. And he realized he was afraid of sharks. So he started playing basketball at the age of 14. Come on. Doesn't that origin story fit Tim Duncan and his personality? He was NBA Finals MVP three times. He won the NBA MVP two times. NBA All-Star 15 times. All-NBA First Team 10 times. All-NBA Second Team three times. All-NBA Third Team two times. He was always a team first guy. He didn't like the limelight. And Tim Duncan once said that he just viewed himself as a basketball player. He showed up, he played, and he went home. Didn't have much marketing behind him or hype. As a team first guy, he had such an incredible individual impact on the consistent winning ways of that basketball team. Think about this. His team went 1,072 and 438. Over the NBA regular season in the 19 years he played. That's not just the best 19-year record in the history of the league, but over all four major American sports during that same era. He's only the third player in NBA history to win a 1,000 regular season games. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Robert Parrish are the other two. So we're talking about a guy who was the anchor, the man that made them the best defensive team in the NBA. And just a consistent scorer on the other end of the court, such a savvy basketball player. That's why he was 5-1 in the NBA Finals. He was a winner, a two-way player, 
Didn't give a damn about his stats, just wanted to win. Oh, and by the way, just so happens to be the greatest power forward of all time. My number five, Tim Duncan. My number four, Larry Bird. Clutch, fire, passion, insatiable desire to win, killer. It doesn't matter what words you use to describe Larry Bird, but he's actually become underrated by a lot of fans today for their different reasons. And again, full context, I was a Larry Bird hater in the 80s. Still don't like him. Magic was my first favorite player, and then my Bulls drafted Michael Jordan. That should tell you everything you need to know why I didn't like Larry. Fans today look back at film of Larry Bird, and they don't see those eye-popping windmill dunks, the awe-inspiring crossovers. But what they fail to recognize... Because it's, it's understandable. There's only so much time in a day. You know, as far as going back and studying stuff for some of them. But he was torching some of the great athletes in NBA history. It didn't matter if it was Dominique Wilkins, Clyde Drexler, Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rudman. Didn't matter. Took them all to school. He even once hit a game winner over both Scottie Pippen and Michael Jordan. So this notion that his game wouldn't translate to other eras is ridiculous. It's the other way around. Can you imagine with the green light that players have today, the type of numbers that Larry Bird would put up as a three-point shooter? Three-point shooting was frowned upon back then. It was used as a bailout shot or a desperation shot late in games to try to close a lead. There's talking heads in the national media that have no context on that at all. There's one I can think of. He's admitted that he doesn't even watch games. That guy's not very smart. Give Larry Bird the green light behind the three-point line. Just imagine, just imagine what he'd do. <laughs> there are folks today that are like, well, look at you. He didn't make many three-point shots back then. This guy's now... Yeah, that would have gotten you put on the bench. Paris thought he listened to his coaches. It wasn't about ability. This is how ridiculous that argument is. You got guys like Brooke Lopez who have developed a three-point shot. And there are pundits today who foolishly think Larry Bird and others wouldn't become knockdown three-point shooters if they made that a staple of their game and had the green light like guys today. Come on. Larry finished his career with 24.3 points, 10 rebounds, 6.3 assists, 1.7 steals, 0.8 blocks per game for his career. He averaged 23.8 points, 10.3 rebounds, 6.5 assists, and 47 points, excuse me, 47.2% shooting in the playoffs for his career. Now we have to put some perspective on that. Those are XXYYZZ. Where's the perspective? The perspective is, the context is, he got those numbers within the flow of the Boston Celtics offense. Larry was not out there playing for his stats. Let me give you an example of what I mean, of Larry playing for his stats. So Kevin McHale had scored 56 points against the Pistons in 1985. And Larry Bird was upset that Kevin McHale didn't go for 70. He figured since it was a team they didn't like, he should have embarrassed them more. And 56 points was a Celtics record. So when asked about Kevin McHale's game, Larry Bird told the press, I'll break that record in no time. So Larry decided, screw it. I'm going to prove a point individually tonight. And he went out and scored 60 points against the Atlanta Hawks. And keep in mind, this was during a season where he averaged 28.7 points, 10.5 rebounds, 6.6 assists, 52.2% shooting, 42.7% from downtown, and 88.2% from the foul line. Larry Bird's numbers are reflective of a guy 
who could have put up whatever stat line he wanted. He could score from anywhere. He had a post-up game. He had a great catch-and-shoot jumper. He had that one dribble, quick step, pull-up jumper, right? Unstoppable jump shot, high release. But those numbers, again, reflect another guy who sacrificed his stats for the team and didn't give a damn about the box score. Larry Bird was top 10 in MVP voting 11 times, top five, nine times, top three, eight times, runner-up four times, won three NBA MVP awards. He won two NBA Finals MVPs, NBA All-Star 12 times, All-NBA First Team nine times, All-NBA Second Team one time, NBA All-Defensive Second Team three times, and an All-Star MVP one time. Larry Bird accumulated his resume with a messed up finger from a softball game. If you look at any good picture of Larry Bird, you'll see the index finger of his shooting hand. He's got like this bad protrusion on his knuckle. Also had his career cut short with back problems. Still accumulated all of this. The impact of the Larry Bird against Magic Johnson rivalry. Man. Huge impact on the sport. The popularity that rivalry brought to the sport of basketball, it can't be understated, man. Just do some research on the viewership that those guys drew during their rivalry in the 80s. They set the bar. Jordan raised the bar. It's never been the same since. Never. Just go on a search engine, search in NBA Finals viewership history or NBA Finals ratings history. You'll see what I mean. So Larry Bird's impact on the game was transcendent. All you had to do was give him the ball in isolation. Nobody was stopping him. He had limitations with his lateral movement defensively, but boy, he was a tenacious defender and he got after it. So Larry Bird was a killer. He was clutch. He was a winner. He was 3-2 and in the NBA Finals. And we're talking about a guy that no matter who was defending him, he could take over the game at will and go get you the win. All right, my number three, Wilt Chamberlain. Seven foot one inches, 275 pounds of pure beast. In high school, this is a guy who had a six foot six inch high jump, ran the 440 in 49 seconds, and the 880 in a minute 58. He broad jumped 22 feet, ran a sub 11 second 100 yard dash, also threw a shot put 56 feet. And I've seen accounts that he was bench pressing 500 pounds. Well, He won the NBA MVP award four times, was a scoring champion seven times, all NBA first team seven times, of course, battled with Bill Russell for that spot, all NBA second team three times, NBA all defensive first team two times. Again, that award wasn't created until 1969. He was a good defender, man. The accounts of him having like six, seven blocks on on Kareem Skyhook. Yeah, he blocked Kareem Skyhook six or seven times in one game. Ridiculous. NBA All-Star 13 times. He was a rebounding champion 11 times. And an All-Star MVP one time. Now, the numbers are ridiculous. He had a season averaging 24.3 points per game, 23.8 rebounds per game, and 8.6 assists in 67-68. He averaged over 20 rebounds For 11 seasons in his career, peaked out at 27.2 rebounds in 60-61 while scoring, oh, a measly 38.4 points per game. Jeez. And then, of course, the 61-62 season, 50.4 points per game on 50.6% shooting. He ended up averaging 30.10 points per game on 54% shooting. For his career, he actually made 72.7% of his shots in the final season he played in the NBA. And his skill set was amazing. He's a good post player. 
You know, if you look at that picture in the background, you see these Duncan and hanging on the rim. But in the early days of his career, if he would have gone to the rim with a big power move and done a power dunk, he would have ripped the rim down and the game would have been over. They didn't have breakaway rims back then. But Wilt had a great fadeaway jump shot, man. A lot of people don't know that, but when you really go back and look at his skill set, it was unbelievable. And the thing you got to remember with the old school players, Will Chamberlain couldn't sit down at his computer or on his smartphone and pull up clips of Hakeem Olajuwon. Hello, let me study some Hakeem stuff. Oh, look at that move. I'm going to go outside and try that. You know, our, you know, shorter basketball players, perimeter players couldn't go study Michael Jordan and so on and so forth, right? As access has improved, you know, to all the old footage, players of today have the advantage of going back, studying footage and stealing moves. There's nothing wrong with that. You should do that. Wilt didn't have that advantage. Could you imagine Wilt today? With today's supplements, right? The training equipment. Skills coaches, all that stuff. How much more ridiculous would Wilt Chamberlain be? Now, here's where his legacy takes a little bit of a downturn. You know, um, he was definitely a stats guy. There were points during his career where he chased some individual numbers. He averaged only 18.63 points per game in the NBA Finals for his career. Went 2-4 and four in the Finals. Wilt also averaged only 22.5 points per game in the playoffs for his career. His NBA Finals average is 11 points less than the regular season, and the playoff average is nearly 8 points less than the regular season. And people have said that historically, Wilt wilted in the playoffs and finals. Now, that's being overly simplistic because he had some dominant playoff runs in NBA Finals, right? But overall, that does keep him from the top spot. In Will Chamberlain's first four playoff runs, he averaged 34.6 points, 25.6 rebounds. In his second four playoff runs, he averaged 24.9 points, 27.5 rebounds. Finally got that championship in 1967, and then he added another one in 1972, okay? But with that being said, this guy, you know, he owns, I think, over 65 NBA records. He led the 1967 Philadelphia 76ers to 68 wins in an NBA championship. And here's the key, and I got to bring this up with those numbers, with the playoffs in the finals. He sacrificed his numbers. You know, when people talk about, oh, player A, he plays for stats, and you'll see, well, Will Chamberlain, right? Are we going to ignore that Will Chamberlain sacrificed his own personal numbers When he played next to Elgin Baylor and Jerry West in Los Angeles. So when people say, yeah, Will Chamberlain was a stats guy. Oh, yeah. He was out there to prove a point. Score 100 points on you or whatever it may take. He had a season where they were criticizing him for not passing enough. Led the league in assists. So there you go. He was a stats guy in that sense. But he was a dominant force. And like I said, when you look at the record books, Will Chamberlain is the record books. He would be number one if he was more dominant in the playoffs and finals. That's what holds him back at number three for me. My number two, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Of course, he's the all-time leader in total points. um, Feat of great longevity. In 1971-72, he averaged 34.8 points per game. Also averaged 4.6 assists and 16.6 rebounds. He averaged five assists per game or more in three seasons. Averaged 16 rebounds or more in four seasons. Made 56% of his shots in his career. And also led the NBA in block shots four times. Skyhook, man. Unstoppable. Just unstoppable. On defense, he was a feisty on-ball defender. But a better help defender than one-on-one defender. Good rim protector. He'd get after it. He did have seven games in his career with at least 10 blocks. He absolutely dominated the 1970s, which wasn't the greatest competition, but he, he dominated it. With the Milwaukee Bucks, he had 55 40-point games. 
and will later add on 15 40-point games with the Los Angeles Lakers. He was a solid off-ball cutter, good at running the floor, and of course, as I already mentioned, the sky hook. The funny thing was, he had that great right-handed sky hook, his dominant hand. He actually developed a left-handed sky hook as a counter move to his go-to move, that uh, his sky hook. He could also drop step and finish at the rim as well. And he had nine seasons in his career where he scored more than 2,000 points. He averaged 30.4 points, 15.3 rebounds, 4.3 assists, 1.2 steals, and 3.4 blocks while playing for Milwaukee. And then he went to the Lakers, and guess what happened? He reduced his role. He sacrificed his numbers for the team more and more every year. Just became supremely efficient with the touches that he got on the Lakers. He shot 56.7% as a Laker. Magic Johnson having the ability to dump it down to Kareem in the post. That was just as unstoppable as the Showtime Lakers running the floor. We're talking about a guy that dominated the game. Could take over a game individually. Just give him the basketball. He's going to take over the game. He was a key member of six championship teams. Arguably should have won at least one more finals MVP than he did. He he won two of them. He won the NBA MVP award six times. NBA All-Star 19 times. All-NBA first team 10 times. All-NBA second team five times. NBA All-Defensive first team five times. NBA All-Defensive second team six times. And he was a two-time scoring champion. If you included high school and college, you'd be a fool to not have Kareem as the greatest basketball player of all time. We're talking about the NBA. The guy I have at number one had more of an impact in his NBA career. But again, look at the numbers he put up with Milwaukee. And then look at the way he sacrificed those stats with the Lakers, but yet still remained dominant. All you had to do was get Kareem in the basketball. He could take over the game with his scoring, and he did. He did. Double teamed. Good one-on-one defender. Didn't matter. He was going to get you buckets. And his record in the NBA Finals was 6-4. and four. And I think one of the most underrated aspects to what Kareem brought to the table was his competitive drive. The guy was a great competitor. Angry at times. Kareem didn't take crap from anyone. He'd go after you. It's well known he trained with Bruce Lee. But when you're talking about a guy who could control the game, again, he was a pretty good defender, but he could control the game with his scoring, and you couldn't stop him. You couldn't stop him. There was nothing you could do to stop Kareem Abdul-Jabbar from getting buckets. The accolades, the legacy... But in my opinion, just as important, how dominant he was as an individual basketball player, I've got Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as my number two. And number one, no surprise because it's a consensus. Number one, Michael Jordan. So let's start by talking about the six finals MVPs. When you're talking about the 1997 In 1998 championship bowls, those were the worst scoring supporting casts since 1954 for an NBA Finals MVP. Competition, the 1993 Phoenix Suns put up the same amount of points, the same offensive rating as the modern day Warriors. It's a big reason why Michael Jordan took it upon himself to average 41 points per game to beat him. Hell, if we're talking about the Warriors of today, the 1991 run TMC Golden State Warriors had a more potent offense than today's Warriors, and they didn't even make it to the NBA Finals. The teams that Michael Jordan led the Bulls to victory over in the playoffs 
Like the 91 Lakers, the 92 Cavs, the 92 Blazers, the 93 Hawks, the 93 Cavs, the 93 Suns, the 96 Magic, the 96 Sonics, the 97 Jazz, and 98 Jazz had an offensive rating that was almost the exact same as the modern-day Warriors. Offensive rating adjusts for pace. The game was just being played at a much slower pace, a much more physical, defensively-minded pace. You look at the 1991 championship run, first championship for Jordan, a team where he was the only all-star, beat eight Hall of Famers with a combined career achievements of four MVP awards, six finals MVP awards, two defensive player of the years, 47 NBA championship rings, and five all-star MVPs, or great defensive teams like the 91 Bad Boy Pistons, the 92 Knicks, the 92 Blazers, the 93 Knicks, the 96 Heat, the 96 Knicks, the 96 Sonics, the 97 Bullets, 97 Hawks, 97 Heat, 97 Jazz, and 98 Pacers. Michael Jordan led the Bulls to wins over great teams in a great era with a great Eastern Conference. But just think of the long list of great players that he not only beat, but more importantly, outperformed in the series, like Patrick Ewing, Charles Barkley, Isaiah Thomas, Joe Dumars, Magic Johnson, Glenn Rice, Clyde Drexler, Dominique Wilkins, Kevin Johnson, Alonzo Mourning, Tim Hardaway, Shaquille O'Neal, Penny Hardaway, Sean Kemp, Gary Payton, Chris Webber, Dikembe Mutombo, Reggie Miller, John Stockton, and Carl Malone, and those were just during the championship runs. Michael Jordan beat and outplayed the MVP, the DPOY, Defensive Player of the Year, or runner-up to his MVP every year in the NBA Finals. Every year. Well, going through a physical and tough Eastern Conference with some of the most physically imposing defenses of all time. That argument doesn't work. So again, six NBA Finals MVPs record. Five league MVPs should have been nine. Ten scoring titles. All-time record, Wilt is closest with seven. NBA record for career points per game in the regular season. NBA record for career points per game in the NBA playoffs. Defensive player of the year. Three-time steals champion. Nine all-defensive first-team selections. He averaged 31.5 points per game. Eight rebounds, eight assists. On 54% shooting. The year before he sacrificed all those numbers to play in the triangle offense. So this XX, YY, ZZ comparison stuff. Those type of comparisons should only take place on a piece of construction paper with a Crayola crayon. So comparing his career statistics is not holding his level of play in the proper regard. You have guys whose style of play fills a stat sheet. And then you had Michael Jordan who proved he could do the same thing. But he sacrificed that for Phil Jackson for the triangle offense. And it led to six championships in six straight full seasons that he played. He accumulated his legacy in only 11 full NBA seasons as a bowl. Jordan also finished top three in MVP voting in 10 out of 11 full seasons he played for the Bulls. Top three. He was runner-up for the award three times. And that's where the misconception came in, in my opinion. Well, you can't give it to Jordan every year because it's not fair to other guys. Even though Jordan was the most deserving and best player. At the very least eight times, but I'd say nine. He was even in MVP conversations when he was a wizard. When his body just didn't hold up. He was broken down, bad knees. 
but he proved even at an old age, he was out there schooling. You guys have seen some of the games. He could still school some of the younger players of the next generation. So he scored 31 and a half points on 50.5% shooting as a bowl. Averaged 33.5 points per game in the playoffs for his career, which is ridiculous. 33.6 points per game in the NBA Finals. He averaged a ridiculous 33.7 points per game in the playoffs during the first three-peat. In a ridiculous 36.3 points per game, 6.6 rebounds, 7.9 assists on 52.6% shooting in the first three-peat of the Finals. It's ridiculous. Not to mention he ran a documented 4.3 second 40-yard dash in college with a 48-inch vertical. And his lateral movement, agility, and body control was far greater than that of LeBron or Wilt or the other athletes that you hear brought up in the greatest, you know, athlete from an athletic standpoint conversation. LeBron and Wilt, nowhere close to Michael Jordan from a skill level standpoint in that body control and agility, lateral movement. Michael Jordan's game was esoteric. And when you think about Jordan's off the ball game and how great he was at coming open off the ball, his off ball game doesn't get talked about enough. His cuts to the basket, catch and shoot jumpers. It was elite. So when he sacrificed having the ball in his hands all the time for the triangle offense, mastering that off the ball game was essential. And it made the Bulls triangle offense that much more lethal in his ball and hand game with the spectacular footwork, the control of the basketball, body control in the air, the ability to innovate in the air. Of course, his quick first step Spectacular facial dunks, fadeaway jump shot. Jeez, the the go-to moves, the counter moves, the counters to the counters, and the counters to the counters to the counters, right? That's the part of his game that separates him from the rest in NBA history. Michael Jordan's skill set made it virtually impossible to stop him. And you know what? Kobe Bryant probably said it best. When Kobe Bryant said, well, he called Michael Jordan the master in a sit-down interview, and he said, Michael Jordan perfected the game. Michael Jordan is also the only player in NBA history to win Rookie of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, NBA MVP, All-Star MVP, and Finals MVP in a career. The only one. And in my opinion... These are all facts. In my opinion, his most underrated feat was taking a franchise in the Chicago Bulls and a historically bad owner, Jerry Reinsdorf, and not only winning six championships, but one of the worst owners in NBA history by championship standards outside of the years with Jordan. A guy who during the White Sox 2005 Major League Baseball season. I was listening to the radio, 670 the score. And he said he would trade all six Bulls championships for one White Sox championship. Where does that leave us Bulls fans? Are you kidding me? Yeah, that guy. Jerry Reinsdorf, Michael Jordan, put him in the Basketball Hall of Fame. And look at the joke the franchise has been without Mike. We could talk about all the measurables in the world, the stats, the numbers, the dominant performances. But the greatest attribute that Michael Jordan brought on a basketball court was his borderline psychotic will to win and competitive drive. There has never been a player in NBA history more obsessed with winning than Michael Jordan. It was the combination of his athleticism, his unreal skill level, an insatiable desire to win that made Michael Jordan not only the greatest basketball player of all time when you're talking about NBA, and standard bearer, not only in basketball, 
but in every other sport as well. There have been countless, hundreds of comparisons of athletes from other sports to Michael Jordan. He revolutionized the game. Changed the way the game is played. And he expanded the NBA's popularity on a global scale like nobody before or after. Michael Jordan has a career record of 20 and 7. 20 wins, 7 losses in series against 50 plus win teams in the playoffs. 7 and 2 against 60 plus win teams in the playoffs. In the NBA Finals, 24 and 11 was his games record. Won 24 games, lost 11 games in the NBA Finals. In a perfect 6-0 NBA Finals record in those series. Why? Because he could control the game by making plays on defense. He's one of the greatest defenders of all time. And Michael Jordan with the basketball in his hands? You are not stopping him. He's going to take the game over with his scoring. He didn't need to rely on teammates to win. There were times that he made a play for a teammate, but by and large, it was Michael Jordan taking over those games. And that's what made the Bulls so unstoppable. There were capable players around him. On the offensive end, like I said, the worst supporting casts from a scoring standpoint, 97 and 98, since 1954. But he got the job done. He didn't care about stats. He sacrificed his stats for the triangle offense. He was clutch. He was a killer. He was a champion. And Michael Jordan was a winner. He would rather die on that basketball court than lose. Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. The end. You know, basketball analysis today has become all about the XXYYZ easy analysis. People have gotten really lazy with their rankings and analysis of basketball players. They underrate defense and they overrate rebounds and assists. It's actually gotten to the point where people undervalue a player who you just give them the basketball and they take the game over on their own. Killers, winners, and not enough people talk about competitive drive. Competitiveness is a huge attribute you want to see in a basketball player. That will to win. Refuse to lose. But I'll say this, man. At the end of the day, if you're watching this, you're just like me. We all love the game of basketball. Everyone has their opinions on the all-time greatest players. And it just makes it a lot of fun to talk about, you know, because we all have our points of view. But I just don't see how you could value someone because of stats over someone who can completely change the game defensively, but also on the offensive end. All you've got to do is give them the basketball and they're taking over with their scoring. The NBA has undergone a lot of changes over the years with the rules and the way the game's played, but it's still a wonderful game. Personally, I would love to see the NBA get back to playing a more physical brand of basketball and stop handcuffing these defenders. But it is what it is. I just hope you guys enjoyed this top 10 list of greatest NBA players.